a lecture where I'm supposed to share some of my perspectives about the current condition and possible future for higher education. That's what the dean and others asked me to do, but, and I promise you I will certainly get to that because it's a tough topic that I really enjoy talking about, and it's a conversation that I think is absolutely critical, particularly at this juncture in our country and at this point and all the challenges we face based in higher education. But I do want to just take this moment to step back and share a little bit more about my own experiences, my own life story first. Because as I noted earlier, my personal experiences and the time that I spent here at the University of Georgia factors significantly into my world view and my perspective and my dedication to advance higher education. I think from the introduction and the program, you will know that I'm trained as a plant physiologist or a crop physiologist, and I spent my entire career in higher education at the University of, Illinois, at the University of Minnesota initially, and it's where I started as a research professor and conducted basic and applied research to focus on increasing the yield of important cereal crops like corn, wheat, barley, etc. And then later in that career, after I became tenured, uh, for some reason, uh, the president of the university and others found about, out about this black guy who had a PhD in science, and all of a sudden, uh, I got pulled out of the laboratory, kicking and screaming, by the way, uh, to what my friends called the dark side of administration. <laughs> they say I came to a fork in the road and I took it, but I took the wrong fork. Those jobs are all a very long way geographically and philosophically from southwestern Georgia where I was born and raised the son of sharecroppers who mainly raised peanuts and cotton and I attended the segregated schools of Terrell County, uh, basically George Washington Carter High School. I am the middle child but was the first in my family to obtain a college degree and as you might imagine growing up as an African American in the rural south in the 50s, 60s and 70s it brought some significant challenges when it came to educational, cultural, and social mobility. The question, the question that I'm often asked is, how did someone like you get to where you are today? And the short answer is, I had a heck of a lot of help along the way. And I certainly, now that I know about Mrs. Zerda, I have to add her to that list as well. You know, it kind of started both with my parents, first with my parents. Although they only had a seven or eight grade education, they recognized the value of education as the route for their children to have a much better and much easier life than theirs. They were among the very, very few sharecroppers in our community who were had the mitigated golf to tell the landowners that their children would not miss a day out of school to harvest cotton. You know, when our, my father passed about a decade ago, that was one of the things that I reflected on, the fact that he had that kind of courage. And I can tell you, I would not be standing here today if it were not for that. And then it was probably somewhere at the time I was nine or eight or nine years old, even before I knew what the correct words to use, I knew I wanted to be a scientist and I wanted to learn about the plant world and unravel the mysteries of how things work. I was curious about the things that I saw around me in the peanut and cotton fields. I was very curious about how a green plant could produce this fluffy white material. And I used to spend too much time, apparently, when I should have had my bag bent trying to fill up that a uh, 10 foot long uh, cotton sack. And of course, uh, my mother reminded me what I was supposed to be doing. But as you might say, uh, that was curiosity. And uh, worrying about this white fluffy cotton plant, which I might add was the bane of my existence for far too many years. Uh, from the time that I was about four years old, and they'd make a flower sack out to a cotton sack for you and you would have to go to the field to pick cotton. I often tell people that's why I didn't learn to walk until I was almost two, <laughs> because I knew what the next field was going to be when I was going to pick some cotton. <laughs> but anyway, uh, long story short, this was probably the early part of my early thinking that made it very clear to me and began
beginning to shape the road and knowing that I wanted to be a scientist. But it was really through the relationship of two men, two mentors, two people along the way who became counselors that really was able to make the, my uh, curiosity um, make a quantum leap from just thinking about the possibilities of the world to actually figuring out how to do the very hard work that it took to turn that curiosity into reality. The first of these was someone that uh, shaped my relationship and my future while I was in high school. I came under the tutelage of my Mr. Walter Stallworth, who was a graduate of Tuskegee and was my vocational ag instructor. He's responsible for two major issues in my life. The first thing that he did was start to call me professor in the ninth grade. So I guess it took, stuck somehow. And uh, the second thing he did was told me I was going to college. He was indifferent about whether I went to Fort Valley or Tuskegee, but he wanted to tell you only two options because those are the only two black schools in the state that offered agricultural programs. And so I knew I had to, to make one or two of those choices. And he also made sure that I was on the path to get a degree. You know, college readiness was one of the things that he focused on. And that's relevant only because I had managed for most of my high school career up until about almost 11th grade uh, to navigate around taking any math courses like algebra and trigonometry. <laughs> Mr. Stallworth found out about that and he said, I guess you're trying to not go to college after all, right? And I said, no, sir. So I can tell you, he put me in a situation where I had to take algebra and trigonometry almost at the same time. Don't try that at home. I wouldn't advise anyone to try that. But it was a game changer for me having to be college ready by making sure I had to complete uh, requisites of that to get admitted to uh, Fort Valley State. And the reason I avoided it because I had this significant math phobia. I could do math as long as I was sitting at my seat, but in the old school tradition, the teachers used to make you go to the board and solve the problem on the blackboard, and that terrified me more than it did going to a funeral room and looking at dead people. <laughs> it was at Fort Valley where I met the second person who was very pivotal in my career, Mr. M.C. Blunt. He saw a potential in me that uh, many others perhaps did not see. And he made sure that I was on the path to go on beyond Fort Valley by, first of all, making sure that I had a summer research internship with the USDA Soil Conservation Service, where I was able to earn each summer enough money to pay for my tuition and fees for the next academic year. And lastly, uh, Mr. Blunt, Blunt was not a person that offered suggestions. He gave instructions. So when he told you something, you knew you better listen. He basically told me that I was going to pursue a master's degree. And he told me, you're not going to that other school that offered you admission, but you had to take a year of remedial education before you could actually start the graduate program. He said, you are going to the University of Georgia. As I said, he was an old school advisor. Mm -hmm. I had been around him long enough to listen. And I should note that um, there were two other students that came with me to University of Georgia. I didn't come along. The smartest thing Mr. Blunt did was to send us as a three-person cohort. Dr. Mark Lattimore, who now is in charge of 1890 programs at the Fort Valley State uh, University, was my uh, roommate in the earlier days at uh, Fort Valley, and we completed all three of our degrees together. And of course, Mr. William Buchanan, who came here uh, with me as well, he went to work for the Crop Insurance Service, and in light of uh, this event and where it's located and what we're celebrating, I was sad to learn that his wife, who he met here while she was pursuing a master's degree in the College of Education, passed uh, this past weekend. So I'm deeply sad by that. But I want to know too, that that cohort meant a lot to me because when things got tough, we could rely on each other to keep ourselves on the right path. And uh, we were certainly among the first group if not the largest group of black students to ever populate Miller Plant Science Building and pursue degrees in soil or crop science. And so uh, I've been asked a number of times uh, how I came to choose UGA at the time, and it was certainly a jump in culture. 
since it was the first time that I had studied at a so-called uh, PWI, predominantly white institution. And it was the first time, time I would have the opportunity to be instructed by uh, majority, majority faculty, faculty members. members. At Fort Valley, we had one black student. student. And I remember her first name, her name was Constance. She came to New York and completed all four of her degree, or, or years of study at Fort Valley State way back in the late 60s. And what I've always said in response to that question, why I choose you as UGA, it was because it provided me with the best opportunity to prove myself and a university, university that had the reputation that surely would carry the weight to my career and yeah, help me get, get at the expected, expected purpose and achieve the goals, goals that I had set forth. I was very, very, very fortunate to come under the tutelage, and thanks to the engagement with Mr. Blunt, Blunt, he wasn't just passive in my application to come to this university. He was actually engaged with faculty with members in the uh, crop and soil science, science department, department. And I was very, very fortunate that two guys took a risk on this guy from Fort Valley State, Dr. Doyle Lashley and Dr. Harold Brown. I understand, understand that Dr. Ashley probably, probably passed, passed uh, several, several years, years ago, ago, but it's understanding that Harold Brown is still in this community. I don't know that for a fact, but he is. Please say hello in my regard. And then this is where I truly began to learn what it meant to be a serious graduate student and how to develop and test a hypothesis and how to conduct rigorous research and analyze that and uh, uh, really how really to do scientific, scientific writing, writing, which was just as far into me as trying to write a, a learn a foreign language. And, and I appreciate, I appreciate the patience that Harold Ashley, that Doyle Ashley, 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 Ashley spent with me to teach, to teach me the basic the framework, framework of how to do scientific, scientific writing, writing and, and how, how to defend and present those results among your peers and professional meetings. That was a game changer for me, folks, and I'm greatly appreciative. I also, I also was, was, this was this also was where, where I met, I met other, other faculty, faculty and graduate, graduate students who, who basically stepped, stepped forward, forward in my life and, and they became they supporters and friends, friends both academically and personally. These, these are, are the people, people who truly treated me as a serious student, student equally, equally and fairly. And, 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 and I'm probably, probably even more grateful, grateful for these individuals today than I was at the time because these were the people and, and this, this was, was the place, place that, that set in motion a career that I've that been I've privileged been to lead. lead. But you know, but you I know, do I think, think that, that it would be, be I do I think, think that, that I don't I don't believe that it would be fair to the spirit of Miss Early and her lecture series. To those, to those of you who have invited me to speak, speak, if I don't, I don't be, be quite honest and tell you that. I had, had a few disheartening, disheartening unsettling, unsettling experience here at this great university. And while, and while I was certainly not, uh, not, not unaccustomed to hearing uh, racial, racial slurs, slurs roll off the tongue on some, some people just as easily as they would say good morning, good morning. I have I to admit I was rather naive to, to not, not expect that some degree that this would occur in an academic setting. setting. And that and some of those some remarks, remarks would come, come from the people that were charged with the responsibility of my education. education. And, was and was disappointed that when these incidents occurred, occurred, that there, that there was, was little, little acknowledgement of their occurrence. And, and far too few, few times, times where individuals, individuals that observed this behavior, behavior never, never apologized, apologized for the offense that had been, been perpetrated, perpetrated by the few. By in fact, in fact, it got, it got so, so bad, bad and I shared with the graduate students student last, last night, there was a time, time when I stood out in front of Miller Plant Science Building, contemplating my future. future. And, I and I have to say, say in retrospect, retrospect now, now, what I experienced, I experienced was pale, 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 pale in comparison to what was early experience. So I'm actually ashamed of myself for letting a few words uttered by some misinformed people really put me in a position where I questioned my own educational pursuit. And let's just say I'm glad that it was a fleeting moment because I wasn't sure if I was going to continue my education after University of Georgia. And the prospect of spending another three or four years doing that really did cause me serious, serious uh, contemplation, if you will, about my future. But then I heard the voices of my parents and my mentors that I mentioned to you. And um, it became very clear 
that they were uttering the words, don't even think about it. And so I listened, and I now I'll have to add uh, the voice of this early to that every time I think about this. Don't even think about it. And so that's my response to our graduate students or any student at this university. And don't get me wrong, University of Georgia is no different than Illinois and any other places. I got some stories about Illinois. You would go, what? Really? But well, that's not why I'm here today. <laughs> and so I decided at that point that I would not let anybody but me determine my destiny. As the old folks say, I shook those experiences off and I packed them under my feet and I used them to focus on the positive aspect of studying at this great university. And I used those positive experience at this world-class university to leverage it to get admitted to the University of Missouri Columbia to pursue a PhD with another one of those world-class plant physiologists, C.J. Nelson. And I can tell you, it was great studying under Dr. Nelson, and uh, I was admitted uh, to the university, and after the first year, I was awarded the George Washington Carver Fellowship, who had kind of been my secret mentor because of all the work that he'd done on peanuts, and, and what you think I studied at Georgia? I studied peanuts, of course, <laughs> that's what I said. And I can tell you this, $7,200 a year that the University of Missouri paid was more money than my dad ever made in uh, two years' time. And I can tell you it made a world of difference. And so to move the story for, uh, forward fastly, uh, quickly here, at 26 years of age, after matriculating Missouri, I found myself being hired as the first African American in the Department of Columbia and Plant Genetics at the University of Minnesota. And the rest is history, as they say. And I had a 34 and a half year amazing career that, that ran the gamut, as you heard in an introduction, across research, globalization, public engagement, and administration. So I just wanted to share that bit of context with you, but I also want to step back just a moment and make sure everyone listened, uh, listening right now understand that I'm not interested, I didn't come here to dig up painful memories or to trigger uh, anybody's sense of guilt in, in anyone. Uh, these lived experiences are intensely personal to me, and you might expect they didn't uh, end when I graduated here in 1975. And as I said at the beginning, they were pale in comparison to what this early experience is 14 years before. And I mentioned some of these experiences, and I want to mention something else here uh, that I think is in context as well. It's because some of those devastating incidents uh, of the past two years, many of the far too many of which has occurred here in the state of Georgia, has resonated with me, and really because they parallel some of my lived experiences as well. So I'd just like to spend a few minutes just uh, telling you about that following George Floyd's death, and Ahmaud Arbery's death, and Rashard De Brooks' uh, death in 2020, I was asked by the local newspaper in Havana Champaign to be part of a series where they ask people in the community, African Americans, to write a brief essay about being black in America. And I'd just like to uh, pay tribute to this early legacy by sharing a very brief overview that goes back to more than 90 years of the experiences that my family uh, has engaged in and experienced all the way back to my grandfather and up to my own experiences growing up in the South. And it goes something like this. I quote, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, a city I called home for more than 40 years. I watched the video with the same mix of horror and anger and tears shared by so many others. And my sorrow at this racially triggered killing of Barbary, of Barbary in Brunswick, Georgia, and the fading shooting of Rashad Brooks uh, in the back in Atlanta by Atlanta Police Department, also backed by some dark memories from my own childhood and, and, the, and the experiences of my family growing up in, in, in southwestern Georgia. Just a couple of hours drive from Atlanta and three hours from Brunswick. These tragedies in many ways mirror the, ge the geography and the course of my own experience a generation later. Jogging while black and dogs set loose on a walk by unwelcome neighbors. Strangers shouting, get out of the road, in word from cars as they drove by, sitting in the queue 
for the funeral of a cousin who was innocently, whose life was innocently cut short by the use of excessive, excessive force by police, being summoned to my aunt house in the middle of the night and the dwelling, dwelling bullet really only because the reason that her two sons were actively engaged in the civil rights movement and marched with Dr. King and Mr. John Lewis and others. Driving by smoldering ashes of three black churches burned to the ground. The grandfather, the grandfather I never met because he was shot dead in the front yard of the sharecropper shack by a racist landlord on the day that his eldest daughter was married. And there is something about the sound of a pop pump shotgun being caught that I will never forget as long as I live, especially when I turned and found it level over the hood of a pickup truck and aimed at me only because I was black. My own lived experiences, folks here, both in Georgia and in Minneapolis, unfortunately, are very, very familiar to far too many African Americans, regardless of where you were born or where you live. And the phrase that ring in my head is simply, but by the grace of God, so will I. That could have been an Robert Jones any one of us in this community who uh, have experienced these kinds of atrocities. And so what it was most alarming to me is that, uh, that you don't have to look too far in our country to find that people of color are living through these same experiences today. That is what's so alarming and so disappointing. But I think it's important to everyone to understand the cycle of inequity and lost opportunity that comes when we don't recognize the lessons of the past and worse, that we don't take actions in our power to ensure that the mistakes of history do not become the burden of generations that are going to follow us. That is the most tragic scenario I can think of. So that is why I'm having this part of the conversation with you today. These experiences really did influence my career in the moment, and they played an enormous role in terms of how I shaped my own career and my philosophies about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and equal opportunity. You know, I spent more than 25 years of my career trying to develop approaches and strategies to keep higher education accessible and affordable and create more consistent, effective, and comprehensive public engagement at every institution that I've been a part of. I believe that the critical question of our time is how can universities like ours translate our tremendous physical, physical, intellectual, and educational and political power into equity in education, economic, and social prosperity for our community. That is the most critical problem of the time and challenge, I think, for every higher education institution in this country. So, as I indicated, I want to take just the last few minutes here just to comment briefly uh, about my thoughts uh, about what is the promise and the future of higher education. And there are so many different ways that I could go with that particular subject, but I'm going to offer two critical areas that I believe are essential for the future of higher education. Number one is we must focus on affordability and access to education for all. We must certainly make high quality, affordable college education universally affordable, and we must make it accessible to everyone in our society who wishes to pursue it and, importantly, who have prepared themselves to do so. I fundamentally believe that educating more people and doing it more effective is a major focus and has to become a major focus of higher education institutions. And we need to shift our collective focus, focus to building a broader population of college readiness students long before they even start thinking about applying to our institution. At that point, it's a bit too little too late. Disparities in access, quality, and consistency in K-12 education uh, precludes too many students from gaining admission to college or leaves them unprepared to be successful if they are able to attend. To be clear, what I just said should not be in any way interpreted as another case of universities blaming K-12 school systems for the problems and the challenges we face. 
if there is any blame to be had, it's the lack of college readiness. And I would argue that uh, people like President Moyer and myself, who've been given the awesome responsibility to lead this institution, need to take it as part of our core responsibility to influence teaching preparation, influence college readiness, because it may not be our problem today, but in decades to have, where are we going to get the graduates to populate our university? And for most of us, and for far too long, we have not accepted this responsibility and engaged comprehensively and with K-12 communities in developing the collaborative programs and the focus on college readiness uh, from the first day of our students' educational journey. Universities like ours need to be using every one of our resources and power to lead stakeholders and communities to develop these sustainable, systematic programs that fully and equally prepare every student at every stage of their life with the educational experience that our society demands. And as we enter this population of students ready for college, we have to guarantee that they find it affordable and make sure that we have the wraparound services that once they get on our campus that they can graduate. And I don't get any great pride about six year graduation. I tell my staff, don't talk to me about six years graduation. You talk to me about how many folks were graduating in four, four years, because I know fundamentally how costly it is to graduate in six years rather than four years. And so this is critically important to me, folks, and I could go on and on about this, but let me just leave you with this expression. As someone once said, of all the rights that people have fought and died for for hundreds if not thousands of years, there's nothing more fundamental than a right to an education. I think higher education institutions have a responsibility to work to, with K-12 to make sure that more of our young citizens, black and brown people, and people with no social economic background, have access to an education. And so we uh, tried to do our part in Illinois, and one of the things I'm very proud of is creating something called the Illinois Commitment, a program that provides free tuition and fees for kids from any family in the state of Illinois with a family income of $6,700 or less, and very proud that about 30% of every entering freshman class were recipients of the Illinois Commitment. Very, very proud of this. The last thing I'd like to highlight is in terms of the role and the future of higher education. I believe that universities do have to become the driver for social change, and we have to take ownership for ending systemic racism and inequality. And it starts with addressing those issues on our individual campuses and model the kind of behavior that we expect out of others. I believe that other major drivers of that for higher education is found in our ability to leverage our enormous scholarship and our research to find solutions to this complex problem. And obviously, we um, have been really beset and beleaguered by COVID-19. It has been one of the most difficult things that I've had to deal with in 43 years of higher education. Nobody wrote a playbook or a manual about how to deal with a pandemic. And Jerry and I were uh, talking about this earlier. It's been one of the most challenging things that we've had to deal with. But I also suggest that the pandemic has offered a direct new light on the persistent and insidious issues related to what I call the twin pandemic of racism and generationally embedded racial disparity that afflicts our society. The list of loss is certainly long across the country and across the world. And the pandemic has starkly exposed the huge racial disparity in health and wellness that I think we have an obligation to deal with. Skin color domination, skin color, I'm sorry, continues to be a major determinant and someone's educational and economic mobility. Folks, has been that way for decades. There hasn't been any substantive change. Here in this millennium, we still have that issue. And I can tell you, uh, we have to do something about this to start to rebuild this part of our society. And the way that I'm very pleased, the way we've addressed this is Illinois, We've got some pushback on this, but we created something called the call to action to end racism and injustice in our society. 
I invested more than $2.2 million each and every year to fund research by our faculty in partnership with members in the community to try to find solutions to some of these perennial problems as a way to move us forward. And so we truly do have the potential liability here in our education to take this issue on. And I can tell you, if we don't take it on, then we become part of the problem. We either got to be part of the solution or we will perpetually be part of the problem. So in conclusion, um, there you have it, folks. That is my, those are my remarks to you today. You've heard my story and you know how, uh, you know just how important I hope you know how important this university has played in my career in my life. And um, I've kind of tried to give you a rapid overview of the two critical charged issues that I believe higher education institutions like ours must step up for the benefit of the state of Georgia, the state of Illinois, the nation, and the world. We have a lot of work to do, folks, and much of that future work and responsibility will be in the hands of those of you who are in an audience, the students, the future generation of academic leaders, political leaders, those that will have the ability to shape policy and to shape and demand outcomes that are fundamentally different than what we're receiving today. So I hope that you've learned about resilience and optimism in equal parts, how important that is. And I hope that you have understand and have found uh, that mentors in college who really have to be there to help you along the way. And I hope that you take great pride in knowing that we all share a bond with the legacy of Mary Francis Irving, Charlene Hunter, and Hamilton Holmes. That's why we're here, and that is a legacy that I'm great to be part of. And I hope that you, when you return here to those of you who are gonna be graduating in the future, that you will find a university like President Moorhead alluded to, who has used his history to become more welcoming and to be more committed to advancing the future. So thank you all for the chance to be with you today. And thank you to Ms. Early for giving me the chance and the opportunity to come to the University of Georgia and uh, also provide a path for so many over past few years and the decades to come. This has been a very special day to me, folks. It's not just coming here to have a chance to pontificate with you, but I can't tell you how gratifying it's been to come back and walk the path that I've tread here for more than two years and to see the enormous progress of this university and to see that it is a place that I will always give full credit to for laying the foundation for a life that's been fulfilled with more rewards than I can ever imagine. Thank you very much. I'm deeply honored. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabriel Richards, and I currently serve as the treasurer for GAPS. At this time, I have the privilege to announce our 2022 Mary Frances Early Endowment Awardee. Also, then I will transition into highlighting a snapshot of some of the accomplishments Ms. Mary Frances Early accomplished before UGA and after UGA. And then from there, we will then introduce uh, the cousin of Ms. Mary Frances Early, Ms. Lockley. Chancellor Jones, we thank you for your lecture. It's a perfect segue into um, our scholarship awardee recipient, which exemplified those areas in which you touched on, which are academic success and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. At this moment, will you Join me in congratulating the 2022 Mary Frances Early Endowment Award awardee, Ms. Shamir Covington. <laughs> Ms. Shamir Covington, can you kids come up here and stand next to me? <laughs> so that everyone can see you. 
So this awardee scholarship had three core tenets, which represents diversity and inclusion in the classroom and also surrounding UGA. And also the awardee exemplified the character traits of Ms. Irvin. And the third one was how these funds would be implemented to continue the legacy and advancement that Ms. Early established here at UGA. Ms. Shamira Covington is a doctoral candidate and graduate teaching assistant in the Department of Textiles and Merchandising and Interiors. Her research explores the fashion as a cultural, historical, and social political phenomenon involved in and affected by his histories of colonial domination, anti-colonial resistance, and processes of decolonization and globalization. Her primary interests are in African-American studies within the fashion industrial complex, African diaspora, fashion history, and the womanist pedagogy. Will you please join me in congratulating Ms. Shamir Covington? Ms. Mary Frances Early is the first African American to earn a degree from the University of Georgia. She earned a master's in music education in 1962 and a specialist in education in 1967. Ms. Early was valedictorian of her graduating class at Henry McNeil Turner High School in Atlanta and wrote the school song. She was also valedictorian at Clark College where she earned a Bachelor of Arts in Music after graduating, she began postgraduate studies at the National Music Camp in the Interlock in Michigan and at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. In 1961, Ms. Early transferred to UGA to aid in the struggle to integrate the state institution. She was elected to the Alpha Kappa Mu and Pi Kappa Lambda Honor Sororities. In 2013, she was honored by UGA with an honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Her distinguished career includes becoming the first African-American president of the Georgia Music Education Association in 1981, serving as director of music for the Atlanta Public Schools and an associate professor of music education and chairperson of the music department at Clark Atlanta University and being appointed to the board of directors of the Atlanta Music Club the Atlanta Symphony Associates, and the Young Singers of Collinwell. Ms. Early was worked, has worked as an adjunct professor at Morehouse and Spelman Colleges and has been a panelist for the National Endowment for the Arts, the South Carolina Arts Commission, the Fulton County Arts Commission, and the Atlanta Borough of Cultural Affairs. Ms. Early's most honors, many honors and recognitions include the Star Teacher Award in 1972, the Benjamin E. Mays Music Heritage Award in 1995, the UGA Outstanding Alumni Award in 2000, the UGA Foot Soldier for Equal Justice Award in 2001, and the UGA Graduate School Alumni Distinction Award in 2017. In 2018, President Jerry Moorhead awarded her the President's Medal in honor of her accomplishments and impact on UGA's campus and classroom statewide. Ms. Early wrote Guitar Magic, an audiovisual guitar method for children. She has served on the editorial board for the National Music Educators Journal and served as general music advisor for Teaching Music Journal. The early professorship in the College of Education was established in 2011 with an endowment from the Georgia Power Foundation honoring Ms. Early's legacy. In February of 2020, the College of Education was named in her honor, her autobiography, The Quiet Trailblazer. My journey as the first graduate of the University of Georgia was published and released in September of 2021. Ms. Early is, of course, a currently a busy, busy woman and has you know, many scheduled events. Unfortunately, she wasn't here to join us today, but may we please stand and acknowledge her and praise her congratulate her for all of her accomplishments that she's accomplished. Thank you very much. At this moment,
woman met the cousin of Miss Mary Frances or Miss Lockman. Please come to the stage. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Lachlan. Mary Frances and I are first cousins. Her mother and my father were sister and brother. Dr. Bullhead, Chancellor Jones, Senior Administrative Cabinet, Dean Spangler, faculty and staff, of the Mary Frances Early College of Education, graduate and professional scholars, students, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me now to present some other family members of Mary Frances Early. Would you please stand? This is the 22nd annual Mary Frances Early Lecture Series, and this is the first lecture that Mary has not attended. Believe me, we had to convince her and assure her that we would be here to express how very grateful she is for all the wonderful ways you have honored her over these past 22 years. She wants you to know that her life has been both blessed and enriched with some wonderful people here at the University of Georgia. 21 great speakers who came to honor her over these past years, and to you, Chancellor Jones, for, be, for not being able to meet you and to be a part of this year's uh, lecture series. She also asked me to especially thank the graduate and professional scholars for all that you do to ensure this lecture continues here at the University of Georgia. She is so grateful that all of you have been a part of her journey. This year also marks the 60th anniversary of Mary's graduation from this institution in 1962. Now we all know that a whole lot was going on in America 60 years ago. But Mary Frances decided that, she decided that she could and would attend the University of Georgia to get her master's in music education, and she did. We are grateful for the change in hearts and minds that allow us to be here today. Thank you so very much. And we look forward to returning here with her next year to celebrate the 23rd Mary Frances Early Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lachlan, and for those words. And thank you to the family for being here with us today. Your presence is everything, and this event would not be the same without you. The University of Georgia is proud to host the annual Mary Frances Early Lecture. This is one of our campus community's most anticipated and treasured events. And each year, we have the opportunity to hear an excellent keynote speaker. And to that lineup, we're honored to add UG alumni Chancellor Robert Jones. Thank you, Chancellor Jones, for those inspiring words. This, the 22nd year of the Mary Frances Early Lecture, 
reminds us that a committed individual who chooses to do a difficult thing for the good of the larger society can do just that. Ms. Early's quiet resolve continues to be an inspiration to us all. In a time when loud voices, which are often hollow and void of substance, often take center stage, it is important for us to learn from those who have come before us and have been successful in bringing about long-lasting, impactful, and substantive change. Change that matters, change that brings us closer to a more just, equitable, and fair society. Change that pushes us all to do better and be better. There is much that we can learn from Mary Frances Early, and she has been an apt and patient tutor. Over the years, she has been generous with her time and her wisdom, most recently with the publication of her memoir, The Quiet Trailblazer, My Journey as the First Black Graduate of the University of Georgia. Ms. Early shares her story, the full measure of which can hardly be captured with words. Such an amazing individual. We as a community and institution of society are so privileged to continue to learn from Mary Frances Early. And while she is not able to be here today with us, we all feel her powerful presence as we honor her lasting contributions. Thank you, Ms. Early. And so as we close, we thank each of you for participating in this afternoon's lecture. We believe that you have been inspired and we trust that you will be moved to act in positive and productive ways that demonstrate your own personal commitment to diversity and inclusion at the University of Georgia and throughout the world. Thank you. This concludes the Mary Frances Early Lecture. Have a great day and please join us for the reception immediately following.